with a series like Breaking Bad, I don't think I even need to write some witty intro with a hook about how meticulously crafted it is. I mean, it's got timeless memes and it's also got some of the greatest age-like milk content of all time. Oh yeah, and I guess I would also say it has a pretty decent story, pretty respectable. As much as I joke about it, I do think that the sheer persistence of all the Walter memes is a pretty good proxy in terms of the impact it has had on the industry, in the same way that Boromir's, one to simply not walk into Mordor, has forged its meme-worthy place in the halls of Valhalla. Very, very few shows not only stick the landing, but maintain an active community for years to come, only to then launch a spin-off that, if not exceeds, then at least rivals the original. You've seen the video length, let us go back in time to see how it all began. A bit of a commonality I've noticed with a lot of the excellent shows of the past couple of decades is the cold open. In other words, just dropping the audience right into the middle of the world with zero explanations whatsoever. Think Game of Thrones starting with the White Walkers, Rick walking up to the gas station, more recently The Last of Us opening with talks of pandemics, even something like Death Note dropping you right into the Shinigami realm. As much as it is just a tool to get the audience's attention, I think it is also a very good indicator that the production has a very clear vision for the story and how it will be presented. Camera work, visuals, effects, and everything else can be great, but above all, it's those first crucial minutes that set the tone for absolutely everything to follow. And in that sense, I think the series hits the ground running. We open on this quiet desert that is then sharply interrupted by that almost ringing in your ears before the music kicks in. Think of it this way, we could have opened with the RV right from the get-go, or we could have skipped all of this altogether and just moved to Walter's day. But we don't. By juxtaposing those few seconds of peace and quiet to this ringing in your ears and then that high BPM music, it plants us as the audience in a similar sense of anxiety to Walter, even if we know absolutely nothing of what came before. It is that abrupt transition that tells us that this entire situation is completely out of control. And the same goes for the visuals. Even before we see the RV, we just see Walter's flying pants? It's just an immediate, wait, hold up, what? Of all the things it could have showed us, they show us flying pants? It paints a ridiculous situation that just naturally sparks questions. And on that note, let us talk about pants. Now that right there is a sentence I never thought I'd be writing in a video, but here we are. In this episode, and throughout much of the early Breaking Bad story, I think the simplest way to think about pants is that they symbolize control and strength. It's like the saying of who wears the pants in the relationship, and I don't think the saying actually makes any sense, but you know, it is a saying. In this case, they are literally just flying in the air, implying that Walter has completely and utterly lost control. And when we cut to the inside of the RV, Walter is of course in his now very famous tidy whiteies and nothing else. Him being half naked here is meant to paint him as just pathetic and weak, in the same way that our introduction to Jesse would also entail him being pantsless while fleeing through the window. There's a reason why so many people talk about having nightmares of being naked in public. It's just the ultimate form of vulnerability. More on that in a bit. But when it comes to Walter's overall appearance, a ton of ideas about his traits and appearance apparently came right from Brian Cranston himself. There's even a whole thing with Vince trying to approach Cranston saying, you don't actually have to be naked, you know, we can figure something out, but no, they just agreed that, yeah, he absolutely should be in tidy whities It's apparently even a small little inside joke that Cranston's contracts all say that he must appear in his underwear at least once. And since we're talking about wardrobe, let's go a layer deeper and talk about color. If you've never heard anything about this and haven't noticed it yourself, this is your last warning because this is something you will never unsee again. As with many things in the series, color is always a very deliberate choice. It was one of the first things that was designed for the characters. In this sequence, for example, we have Walter's underwear, his light grayish pants flying off, his light green shirt hanging on the side of the RV, and later we'd also see his green apron. Skylar is just blue. All blue, everything is blue. Everything in the room must be blue. Marie, purple. Always purple, everything is purple. Big picture-wise, Walter's clothes essentially go from light tones to dark tones as he slowly becomes Heisenberg. Unfortunately, I have no idea who made this, but here's a very cool infographic listing off all of Walter's clothes throughout the whole series. In the beginning, it's always light tones, some grays, some whites, some light browns, light blues, etc. But more and more, it begins to skew toward darker and darker tones. 
with most of the super iconic Heisenberg scenes happening while he is in pure black. And the same goes for just about most of the other characters. But we'll dive into the specificities of each, as each character also have their own associated colors. As for the color green, as you might expect, it pops up in regard to those sweet, sweet dollar dues. In this case, Walter's first outing is all about money. The one and only thing on his mind is to get that green, and that is it. And so, I guess very fittingly, he wears nothing except for his little tidy whiteies and a green apron, while a green shirt flaunts in the wind. But okay, enough of the colors for now, let's return to the show. To continue with that, this guy is in way over his head vibe. We see an unconscious Jesse next to him. Behind him are what look to be two dead bodies just sliding back and forth. There's money all over the floor. There's some sort of weird lab equipment. Walter himself is wearing a gas mask and his breathing's frantic. Everything here just signals distress. If you cut out all the bits of silence, this could be a YouTube intro in 2024. As Walter crashes though, we finally get to see his face for the first time. The calculator watch, the glasses, the slightly awkward looking mustache, obviously they're all stereotypes, but they are all traits to make him seem as vulnerable as possible. He is just not made for whatever this is, plain and simple. He runs back into the RV and grabs the gun from the body, surrounded by money. We are already told that this is a story of blood, meth, and tears. Oh, and I guess money too, but let's be real, that goes with tears. He grabs the camera, lays out his wallet, and goes to record a video. Which again, tells us a whole lot about Walter. First off, he wants his family to know that he did all of this for them. Obviously ignoring what happens in the later seasons, he tells us that this is an underdog story. He is a father who did something unspeakable for his loved ones, but he doesn't put the blame on anyone, he just wants them to be safe. Big picture-wise, however, this is our first indication of Walter's obsession with how others perceive him. Even the phrase of, no matter how it may look, immediately points to a degree of manipulation, as in, ignore everyone else, I am the only one speaking the truth. Something that becomes more and more prominent as we get further into the series. Even from a visual sense, he puts on the shirt first. Both to look more presentable, as well as because that green shirt is a shield of, I did this because my family needed money. Ditto for him saying that this is not an admission of guilt. On one hand, it is just a sign of intelligence, since, well, I think we've all seen legal proceedings that don't seem to make a lot of sense with this sort of stuff. Direct admissions are sometimes ignored, and sometimes people are just yoinked with no evidence at all. So Walt just claiming that, from a strictly legal perspective, he is not pleading guilty or anything, just tells us that, even in a situation like this, while he is certainly being pushed to the edge, details like that still do not slip his mind. But on the other hand, it is again a matter of controlling the narrative. It's him saying, your eyes might tell you that I'm guilty, every bit of evidence might point to me being guilty, but no, I am not. This is an ego problem above all else. This is him saying, what I did is justified, but I actually didn't do it. And then there's the laying out the documents parts. This isn't him hiding evidence, this is a very smart dude knowing that he's about to be caught, and consciously choosing what happens next. It might seem like all of this is completely out of control, and in many ways it absolutely is but our Captain Underpants still operates with intent. And I think that is encompassed beautifully as he walks onto the street and just points the gun at the hill, ready for whatever comes next. Despite everything we've seen in these past three extremely chaotic minutes, this dude is the most headstrong man west of the Mississippi. Not American, I don't know where the Mississippi is, so let's pretend that made sense. Yes, I know I could Google it, but I'm not going to. We'd of course see the true continuation of all of this at the tail end of this episode, but as of now, it raises a quite perplexing number of questions, like who is this guy, who does he think he is, and how did he even end up in this situation, because right now, it's borderline comedic. And that is just the cold open. Welcome to Breaking Bad. We then flash back three weeks earlier with a sleepless Walter. Restlessness is obviously a sign of overthinking, which we'll get to in a second. But the concept of waking up is one we'd also revisit in this same episode. In this case, I think it marks an important point of reference when it comes to that, in this case very literal, awakening. He wakes up, walks past all these still unpacked baby supplies, and just goes to walk on this weird walking thingy. Apparently even this small manual thing is a Stairmaster. I always thought that it was just like the big ones at the gym, but apparently this is the same thing. Currently, Walter is just numb. I think the fact that we never see him roll around or anything is pretty clearly telling us that this is the norm for him. The way the scene plays out, it really feels like this is basically a part of his routine. And I think that is further solidified as he just stares at the award. 
Instead of having that stereotypical scene of looking right into the mirror and thinking, who is that looking back at me? We instead get a scene of him looking at what could have been. And the entire sequence happens in that odd, odd time that is not quite the morning, but not quite the night. It's 5am. Shout out to everyone who gets up at 5. I used to do that for 3 years straight myself. Do not recommend. Feels like the world has died. Like, seriously, there is literally no one around. We already heard Walter's full name with the recording, but with it being such a consistent detail throughout the series, I've always wondered whether there's some deeper meaning in his full name. Funnily enough, there is a very real Walter White. Vice has a video on that if you're curious, but I don't think that has much to do with anything. Gilligan has said that the last name of White is meant to loop back to that monotony that they wanted to portray with Walter. It's dry and has this alliterative sound to it with Walter White, which later also plays into the whole WW angle. In Gilligan's words, it's just milk toast. As for his middle name, Hartwell, I always assume that it's meant to be a play on words, as in Hartwell, as in his heart is in the right place. But that doesn't really track for that long, so it seemed like an odd choice. A Redditor also pulled a bit of a Charlie and noticed that Hartwell is an anagram for Walter, and the only leftover letters are L and H, his other two primary aliases. There is Walter, there is Heisenberg, and then there's Lambert, in reference to Skyler's original last name. That is 1 million percent not intentional, but a cool coincidence, I guess. In reality, Vince just really likes referencing the most random of things in his work, and it's actually a reference to his girlfriend's middle name. It also pops up in X-Files as Partwell College, and there are a whole bunch of other cross-references between those two shows. But anyway, returning to the episode, he stares at the award where he is listed as the team lead in crystallography in a project for proton radiography. Hey, that kind of rhymes. It's actually the same word. Doesn't even rhyme. I'm a goofy man on the internet, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. But proton radiography is like a cooler version of x-ray, I think. But more importantly, it is also a part of cancer treatment where the tumor itself is blasted by protons. Or something like that, anyway. So, in a very roundabout way, Walter not only missed out on millions, he also potentially missed out on working on the thing that he himself would later need. And the crystallography part obviously points to everything we'd be seeing. As of now, we don't get a direct mention of grey matter just yet. But this is just a permanent reminder of not just a thing he doesn't have, but the thing he himself let go. This isn't a, if only I'd invested into like, I don't know, Bitcoin in 2003. This is something he literally held onto, but gave up for pennies. This is a, I invested in Bitcoin in 2003 and ordered a pizza with it. Later, we'd of course learn just how obsessive he had become with it, with him continuously tracking the value of his shares. But as of now, it just plays into that angle of this being an incredibly intelligent dude who has somehow ended up as a literal NPC with just nothing going for him. Oh, and also half of his face is shrouded in darkness, so we already have that two-faced nature. And the same thing continues as we hop on over to their breakfast. This being Walter's birthday establishes a very clear point of reference in terms of how much time will have passed. Also, apparently Walter was originally meant to be 40, but AMC pushed for him to be a bit older, so that's kind of fun, I guess. But the most important bit is the whole veggie bacon debacle. It does somewhat date the show, as it really feels like a 2010s conversation, but it establishes that this entire family is at least somewhat health conscious, which again will play into that angle of this straight-laced dude breaking bad. Though more importantly, it goes against that ultra macho Luffy Omega Chad give me meat vibe. Sure, Walter is a bit like, what is this, but he doesn't push back at all. He just accepts it for what it is and moves on. And to contrast that, when Walt Jr. shows up, he immediately goes on the whole, no, I want real bacon. Even his son has more of a backbone than he does. Okay, but for real, number one, bacon is disgusting. And number two, how can you eat something that fatty for breakfast? How do you not like immediately get sick? And the same goes for Skylar telling Walter that he gets paid until five, therefore he works until five. Skylar is the one who really wears the pants in this household. As for Walt Jr., he also knows that he is late because there was no hot water. Again. Which further adds to that sense of Walter's entire livelihood just hanging on by a thread. Just like a wall is never just a wall in a story, I think having to take these cold showers is another very explicit sign of Walter's detachment from everything, really. It's not just money problems, it's that even these little comforts they do have are also falling apart. Especially with Walt Jr. unknowingly almost rubbing that salt further into the wound. Buy a new hot water heater. How's that idea? And I mean, we don't even need to think of it in a super abstract form. This boiler would become an actual plot device later on. So for now, just hold that thought. 
And while we're still talking about Walt Jr., I think it'd be remiss of me not to talk about creating a character with cerebral palsy. After doing a little bit of digging, Vince's inspiration for such a character apparently came from a close friend in college. His perspective on the thing was basically just, I don't see a lot of characters like that in media, so when there's an opportunity to show something like that, I like to take it. Which I think is a really good way of looking at it. And I mean, this series is set in the real world, it makes perfect sense. I have an autoimmune condition myself, it's just realistic. He doesn't have to be made out to be some huge deal or anything like that, and even if it doesn't have some crucial impact on the story, it's just there because, well, it is there, simple as that. Story-wise though, I think it's just another one of those things to show just how much Walt has on his plate. It's not just money troubles, it's not just the unintended pregnancy. It's also this angle of constantly having to manage insurances and whatnot. But at the same time, it also shows us just how close Walter and Walt Jr. are, with them driving to school together, generally bantering around, etc. etc. I guess the simplest way to summarize all of this is just that it makes us more sympathetic to their entire situation. We then jump on over to Walt's class, with him talking about how chemistry is the study of change. This is obviously one of those super foreshadowy scenes that encapsulates the entirety of Walt's story. First off, note the colors again. Out of the three spray bottles, he sprays the green and the red onto it, leaving the blue one behind. I think the two ways of looking at this is that this could be the blood and money sprayed into the fire, or it can be Jesse's red and Walter's green shirt mixing in the fire, while Skylar's blue is left behind. As for the whole growth, then decay, then transformation, I mean, we've all seen those Breaking Bad tribute edits, that is Walter's entire story. He grows and grows with grey matter, leaves it behind, decays into this pushover, gets his diagnosis, and then boom, transformation into Heisenberg. And speaking of, even in his own class, we again see how he is disrespected and doesn't really push back at all. More on this in a second. Also looping back to their breakfast and Skylar telling him to leave as soon as his hours are over, we see that he is the last one in the office, probably pointing to the fact that he once again worked extra for no real reason. Cutting on over to the car wash, we once again see Walter working 100% by the book to the point that it feels unnatural. Claiming this to your car wash professional, thank you. Maybe it's me just being a socially awkward weirdo, but the whole line feels so extremely forced and not how people normally talk. Which just further adds to that sense of Walter having little to no autonomy in his own life. Also, and this may totally be me overanalyzing, but this being a car wash specifically also works as a bit of a foreshadowing to this being a money laundering place. Or, in other words, washing the money clean. Anyway, we then see Chad, yes, that is his actual name, recognize Walter in the car wash. Much like with just about everything thus far, it just further disrespects Walter. In the classroom, despite him being a bit of a headache, Walter is still the authority. Well, in the real world, old Chad is very much a Chad, not respecting any type of manual labor. Please be nice to like cashiers and basically everyone who works with people, they are probably miserable. And as if old Walto hadn't been dunked on enough, on the way back home, even his glove compartment breaks. So, in addition to everything we've seen already, even his car is old and is breaking down. As Walter returns home, late by the way, and sees the whole party being thrown, we are introduced to the Omega Chad that is Hank. Unlike Walter, whose two separate introductions have been either half-naked or a lonely sleepless man, Hank literally busts out a gun and goes on a whole lecture. If Walter has trouble standing up for himself, even in a family setting, then Hank is the mirror image and is talking up a storm just non-stop. If Walter's glasses are currently a symbol of weakness, then the Gigachad Hank's blacked out shades are just hanging on by his neck. As for his color scheme, usually we'll see Hank in a mixture of browns, oranges, and sometimes beige. Basically think of a color that is sort of dependable, it's sort of rugged. He's a hero in a story that is full of villains, and so he gets the dependable color scheme. In terms of the family dynamic, there too Walter is snubbed because Hank is just the cooler uncle. Where Walt talks about eating veggie bacon, Hank just gives Walt Jr. his gun. Even lines like, Tevi. That's why they hire men. <laughs> It's not meant to be mean-spirited, but everyone's getting a laugh at Walt's expense. Even by the wardrobes, note how everyone in this scene are wearing just some basic shirts and a jacket on top. Walter's knitted sweater is making him stick out in the crowd. Oh, and also, Gomez for some reason toasts the camera, so that's pretty cool, I guess. Oh, and also, also, this is absolutely overanalyzing, but behind Walter, there are only green and orange-slash-yellowish balloons. As in, the money and the meth looms over him. Okay, you know what? Actually, that's not even overanalyzing. They literally went out of their way to get blue cups, as the red ones you see, like, literally everywhere would be too overpowering for the scene and we don't want that. We then get to Hank and the drug bust on TV. 
In hindsight, obviously this seems like Walter is just mesmerized by the amount of money on display. But as of now, I don't think he has any intentions of Breaking Bad. I think it's more so just surprise and morbid curiosity, really. In a foreshadowy sense, clearly Hank saying that it's easy money. Until we catch you, sets up the entire story. But in this situation, I think while the gears are certainly spinning in his mind, there is not really any intent behind Walter's words. That said though, when looking at this from his point of view, I do think there's a certain degree of main character syndrome. You know how in the real world there's always that one guy saying, oh those guys got caught but I never would, or oh only dumb people get addicted to gambling, they should have just stopped, and so on. It is just pure hubris and I think that's exactly what's slowly coursing through Walt's mind. I think there is a degree of, I could never be caught and I would do it so much better. The major thing holding him back now is just apathy, but with his diagnosis, well, things would change very, very quickly. And the last thing we see here is Skylar selling off another vase, so again, money problems. Oh, and uh, they also talk about some stuff and things, and they do some stuff and things, but uh, let's skip that. We then jump on over to Walt in the car wash again, where he sees a woman in a green dress. Or, if our color interpretations track, it is again a representation of money and status. Considering how obsessed Walt was with Grey Matter, I think you could even take this to be a representation of Gretchen. But point is, that is the last thing he sees before he passes out. His last thought is money, something that would be extremely important in just a moment. Because the next thing we see is him talking about not having the greatest of insurances. Sorry Americans, I cannot relate. I have seen memes of people being afraid of getting on ambulances though, so I guess this must be a very realistic depiction of that. But anyway, getting to the hospital, I love the uncomfortably pale and monotone yellow as Walter is wheeled in. It's that slightly off-white, slightly uncomfortable, like slightly dirty color that just has this weird uncomfortable sense to it. And also, very visually, we are shown how his life is literally turning upside down. And that reflection of his face on the desk also shows us the sort of mirror image of Walt now being born. This is the moment where that numbness twists from apathy to hubris because, well, now there is, to put it bluntly, a clear ending to the story. And I think that is portrayed beautifully as we hear that ringing in his ears as he casually just notices the stain on the doctor's shirt. Mr. White? Yes. On a day-to-day -day basis, he is so disconnected from reality that this is just a matter-of-fact statement to him. It's almost like, oh, I must be having a really bad week. Heater is broken, students are a nightmare, even my car is breaking down. But I guess, you know, it is what it is. It's like he doesn't even register the severity of this because he is just numb. And that continues as Walt gets home and is roasted by Skyler for using the incorrect card. Walt, the MasterCard's the one we don't use. It is again just a thing of stacking one thing atop the next, atop the next, atop the next, and we're like, okay, I kind of see how you ended up where you ended up. Though with his diagnosis now confirmed, we are quickly nearing the point of that rapid transformation that Walter was talking about in class. We again jump to the car wash where, just like many times before, they are understaffed. Only this time, when Bogdan tells Walter to go on cleanup duty, he gives us the ever iconic line of You! And your eyebrows! This is those years and years of bottled up anger, disappointments, and apathy all blowing up all at once. He has hit just absolute rock bottom, and in the pits of that decay comes transformation. And as a very explicit callback to that, we see him sit by the pool just tossing matches. This is him, match by match, lighting that flame that would spark that transformation. A flame that would forge him anew. And the overall composition of the scene is also just that. Their backyard is a complete mess. The colors are really cold, the pool is unclean, there's a pool noodle and some sort of weird mattress thingy just floating around, perhaps also functioning as a reminder of the better, more fun times. But the overall scene is miserable, it is one of decay. And so, Walter decides to shake up his life and agrees to go on that promise ride along with Hank. Again, note the white puffed up vest. Sure, there is an argument to be made that he's a civilian and so he just doesn't get to wear the DEA ones. But on a symbolic level, he is the odd one out and still the quote-unquote innocent character in all of this. Ditto for the glasses. Initially, they represent his weakness, while later, just like the Omega Chad Hank, he'd use similarly blacked out shades. Also, also, apparently they replicated real breaching units movements basically one for one to just really get the realism down for this sequence. Based on what we see here, I'm not surprised. It's not something super bombastic, they're not throwing grenades everywhere, it's just a line of dudes breaching a house. And also note Hank and Walter briefly talking about the dangers of phosphine gas. 
Meth labs are nasty on a good day. You mix that <laughs> and you got uh, mustard gas. Phosphine gas. One whiff will kill you. That's why the respirators. Something that would of course come back into play at the tail end of this episode. As we cut to the lab, notice the presence of red, red, and more red. That of course being Jesse's color. His extra spice of chili, also red. That is the business they're involved with. It is blood red. And I think Emilio sitting in that bright blue jumpsuit just contrasts that even further. And I suppose you could also take it to be a hint of the antagonistic nature of his and Jesse's relationship through those directly opposing colors. Walter now also asks whether he can see the lab. I think it's that curiosity that is now slowly beginning to morph into intent. But as Hank and Gomez go inside, he sees Jesse, who too is introduced in just his red underwear. Just like with Waltz, we open the story with both of them being at the precipice of that transformation. So with the idea of this fast money business now sewn, and with a very personal link to someone in said business, Walter tracks Jesse down to make his pitch. In a weird way, I think there's a degree of ego here too. It's one of his students now working in chemistry, his own field, right? Like we'd see when they actually start to cook, there has to be that teacher's curiosity of how much did I teach you, are you using my lessons wisely, etc, etc. I can guarantee my literature teachers would be doing a double take if they knew what I was doing here. I was a 100% STEM boy and found literature excruciatingly boring. Now I am literally talking about color for 30 minutes. Education systems, please update your reading slash discussion topics, thank you very much. I got a degree in the wrong thing because of you. But yes, Walter and Jesse strike up a deal of sorts, with Walter already being a ton more resilient than with his own students, for example. For the first time, there is a power balance in play and Walter actually revels in it. He exploits it and makes Jesse work for him. Before we follow up with Waltz, we get a small scene of Skylar and Marie to continue on that thread of Skylar just auctioning off random stuff to help with their money issues. And we also see a bit more of Marie's characterization, with her throwing jabs at Skylar about how in 50 years she'd be rich and whatnot. But more importantly, she immediately shoots down Skylar's idea of writing short stories, just bluntly saying that they don't sell. That purple, or more precisely pure pure color scheme, is one of royalty. To Marie, everything is about those sweet sweet dollar dues and how others perceive her. It is one of status. In a way, it's kind of the same thing as we see with Walter, but there it's kind of different because for Walter it's a necessity and then he begins to revel in it. With Mary, it's more so about how others perceive her and less so the actual money. There's a whole lot more to say on that, so I guess we'll talk about that soon, TM. We then see Walter's little heist on the school, but note the green apron on top of all of the supplies. This is now his money pile, and the green apron on top is almost a flag to signal that. Also note his new shirt. Yellow in the story often pops up in regard to danger, meth, suffering, and so on. Think of like a big yellow warning sign, the plates, Gus's uniform, Walt's early cooking days, much of Jesse's looks, when he's not wearing red that is, and so on. I think this pale yellow is sort of a discolored white, which sort of implies that decay, right? As Walter swings by Jesse though, we see even more of that me begin to pop up. When they're talking about the different flasks, he almost takes personal offense to Jesse not knowing them. Many, or maybe even most of Walter's problems, will come from the sense of never having enough and just never being able to perfect things. So much like his obsessive attitude over their products, he takes Jesse's failures, maybe not quite as his own, but they anger him because he is the one who taught him. He is just too prideful. Even if Jesse didn't like chemistry, even if he didn't pay attention in class, well, he was the teacher, surely Jesse must have understood something. Again, now that the power balance is sort of swayed in Walter's direction, it's just that pride beginning to seep out. Realizing that Jesse's house won't exactly work as a cooking spot, they then set their targets on the RV. Okay, I absolutely know this is not intentional, and yes, I promise I'll stop talking about the color at least somewhat, but note the color scheme of the bank. The title is green, signifying money. And then you have that yellow, swirly boy surrounded by black. Or, in other words, Walter's meth business that is shrouded in darkness that leads right into that money. Okay, I admit that's just dumb. But they then talk about why Walt's even doing all of this. Jesse says that for him, it's just a matter of money, and while Walter echoes the same thing, Jesse is still not convinced. And so, Walter just fires back saying, I am awake. <coughs> this ties back into that sleepless night and the whole transformation speech. The Walter of old, that had the drive to even contribute to things like getting the Nobel Prize, has now been awakened. Only this Walter has seen a whole lot of bad. And so, that now genius and prideful mind has turned to something far, far darker. That numbness and really intellectual ability that allowed him to just coast through life will now manifest in a far more dangerous form of recklessness. 
and that is immediately showcased as we jump on over to Walt Jr. struggling to put on pants, which again have been established as a symbol of strength. Walt goes to help him out, but there's a whole bunch of dudes teasing him. Much like with Bogdan's luscious eyebrows, we see Walter just blow up as he goes right for their legs. In part, because that's where they tease Walt Jr., but also because it is a strike against their fundamental abilities, if you will. It's not like getting punched in the nose or something, no. He pushes him to the ground and humiliates him because he finally revels in that feeling of just being awake. Now that he thinks he has nothing to lose, the power balance has swayed in his favor. So with Walt's ups and downs, or I guess downs and ups out of the way, we finally get to the meeting for their first ever batch. Not to repeat everything I said with the opening sequence, the whole green shirt, yada yada, still remains true here. For Jesse, on the other hand, we see that he has changed from his usual red to yellow, which again signifies meth and the suffering it brings. In this particular instance, it also connects them to Crazy H, who too is yellow. As for Walt's cooking, a cool detail here is that it is actually relatively accurate. They had an actual DEA agent on set who guided them through the entire process. Obviously, they didn't want to film a tutorial, but all the processes we see here is not just some wow chemistry time-lapse, they are actually mostly legit. In terms of more colors though, for some reason, Walter does swap out aprons a few times. But you might notice that the shots are framed so that there is always something yellow, green or red in the background. Be it the chemical tanks, the gloves, the cans, the cooler and whatever that thing is. And we also begin to explore the equally volatile variable that is Jesse himself, with Walter already having to tell him that this is purely to sell, not to use. Jesse's role is one I definitely aim to explore far more in depth in the future, but he exists in this overlap between Walt's need for money, his paternal instinct, and his failures as a professional, both in regard to Grey Matter as well as his teacher. I know a lot of people think of Jesse as almost an adoptive son for Walter, and while I think that is definitely a part of it, I don't think it is just that especially with all the conflicts about the recipe and whatnot we'd see later on. As of now though, it just becomes a bit of a bad omen for this entire scheme. As much as Jesse might know the business and is crucial in kickstarting their entire operation, he himself would also be a bit of a loose cannon very, very soon. An interesting thing to note is that once we first meet Crazy Ace, he is in all white, perhaps already telling us that in his own time, he is clean. As in, he is actually an informant for the DEA, or more specifically, to Hank and Gomez directly. Again, later we see him in the yellow vest, so this could be intentional, but not sure. And speaking of, the whole snitching angle is already introduced here with the return of Emilio. Oh, and both Crazy 8 and Emilio would of course later, or I guess earlier, pop up in Better Call Saul as well. The whole reason why Emilio is even free is because of that whole Kim and Saul connection, but that doesn't really tie into anything just yet. Also, as Jesse begins to talk about selling, it is again just all red, even down to the completely random LED strip in the background. Considering how this deal would go, I'd say it's pretty fitting. And speaking of, as they make it to Walt's little restaurant, Emilio immediately recognizes him and thinking that Walt is the one who ratted them out, puts them in a bit of a dicey situation. Oh, and isn't it funny to think about how Walter could have been immediately ratted out to Hank directly had Emilio not pulled the gun right away? Crazy 8 is an informant for Hank and Gomez. I guess there is an argument to be made that Crazy would have wanted to keep Walter around for his own gains. But hypothetically, Breaking Bad could have ended after the single batch, so that's pretty neat I guess. And actually, looping back to Hank's raid, we focus on the chemicals as Walt takes red phosphorus. Phosphine gas. One whiff will kill you. That's why the respirators. This shows us the first instance of Walt using brains rather than brawn, something we see plenty of times throughout the series. Gilligan and Cranston have both been very clear about how much of the macro story of Breaking Bad was shaped by The Sopranos. And don't worry, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but with Tony, he is already a very powerful dude right from the get-go, whereas with Walter, we start with your everyman who basically doesn't stand up for himself at all. And I think it's because of that that these crucial turning points in Walt's character always hit super hard exactly because we never expect these sorts of things from him. But the thing is, unlike Tony, who is actually capable of these things, early seasons Walter is always pulled back by that, well, inexperience. Each and every one of these huge explosions are always juxtaposed by the whole plan completely falling apart. I think that is exactly what made Breaking Bad so addicting to watch, because it wasn't just a huge plan, there was also a how are we going to get out of this huge plan. To use a season 1 example, the whole bathtub plan, I mean, it worked, but it also, like, really, really, really didn't work, right? 
And by the way, I know a ton of people who love Breaking Bad still have not watched The Sopranos. Please fix that. It is a much, much slower burn, but I think it definitely still holds up and will shed a whole lot more lights on how Breaking Bad even came to be. But anyway, with Crazy and Emilio now blasted, we go full circle to the opening. Only this time, we actually see the whole thing through. Walter is not a Chad waiting for his capture. No, this is still the same dude who, just a few days prior, wallowed in misery while staring at his awards. And so, he briefly gives up entirely, only to realize that the gun still has the safety on, and then it just goes off into the ground. And I think the framing here is also super intentional, with it being this ever so slightly canted shot to portray Walt's distress. It is also pointing upward, making Walt look smaller and more insignificant. And of course, he is also literally half naked, so it accentuates that absurd side of him. But my favorite bit is actually just the prolonged stationary shot which allows us to see Walter just awkwardly stumble around for a bit trying to figure out what to do. I think it just really captures that unease. But to completely subvert that, Walter of course notices that those are not cops, those are firefighters. And so, he just puts the gun behind his back and hides in plain sight. This is effectively Walter's first dance with death, and its conclusion is just about as absurd as the rest of the situation. He might be incredibly intelligent, but when it comes to this business, he is a pantsless fool. And just like that, the music goes from that intense metal to a far more a beat vibe. I think this is supposed to be a dryer, but it now brings the money into the absolute forefront, while also framing Walter as if he is now a rat in a wheel that is just trying to chase it down. Even with these just handful of bills, he is already trapped and is just chasing around for it. And the final shot of the episode also brings us full circle as he gets into bed. Only this time, he is not sleepless and he is not alone. Instead, he pushes on to Skylar and, well, you know. As he himself said, he is now awake. I think the purpose of the pilot is to show us just how numb to the world Walter is. To break him down completely and to show us how, once pushed to the brink, even a man like Walter can quickly turn to, for lack of a better expression, the dark side. He doesn't dramatize any of it, it just shows a man who has a lot of money issues and an avenue for potentially some quick money. It begins to ask whether everyone involved in this business is truly evil or perhaps some do it simply out of necessity. Much like with any good morally grey character, the greatest thing about Breaking Bad is how, up until the very, very end, we understand how Walter ended up in these situations. I mean, sure, jumping to a drug kingpin isn't many people's first choice, but at this point in the story, I think most of us were very sympathetic to Walter's cause. I mean, take one look at how many people jump into these pseudo-money-making schemes. Financial burdens can very quickly break someone down and make them really detached from society because if society doesn't help them, then why should they? And the most dangerous cases are when the person in question is incredibly intelligent. I mean, look at most hackers. It is quite hard to untangle hindsight from all these conversations as we know that eventually many of Walter's actions are completely irredeemable. But even so, we may thoroughly disagree with what he's doing, but I still think the story always shows us why and how he arrived to that decision. To return to that Tony Soprano example, it's not throwing us into a very well-established mafia. Instead, it begins with the normalist of families just struggling to get by. For many people, all it takes is for that one domino to fall, and once you've got nothing to lose, well, some will break bad. I hope you enjoyed this pilot episode of what I hope will become a long stay series for the channel. Even 13 pages later, I still feel like there's a ton I could have said about the premiere alone. You know, like the little fact that the industry standard title of pilots could also hold a double meaning for the pilot light of a gas stove upon which Walter begins his cooking. But anyway, do let me know if I missed anything super big in the premiere, do let me know what you think about this little series and whether you want to see more, and on that note, I hope to see you back next time as we continue overanalyzing Breaking Bad. And that's the video. Breaking Bad has always been something I wanted to cover on the channel, so now that I have a couple years worth of YouTube experience under my belt, I thought it's finally about time. Guess we'll see how this whole project turns out. Who knows, maybe I'll still be here in four years talking about like Better Call Saul or something. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.